My question is, seems like only Brother Kennedy is happy. Brother Kennedy, are you happy? Amen, hallelujah. Is everybody happy? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It's wonderful to see all of you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and to all our visitors, good morning. As we say in Tagalog, magandang umaga. All right. If I will ask you a question, as a Christian, what is your goal in life? Okay. What is your goal in life as a Christian? I'm pretty sure most of our answers would be to go to heaven. Am I right or am I right? There's no in between. Tama po ba? I mean, sorry. Tama po ba is Tagalog term for am I right? Brother Charles will probably ask me later, why are you speaking in tongues? Uh, here's another question. If I die right now, not you, I. Now, the question is, if we die right now, will I go to heaven and be with God? If your answer is yes, then you would have achieved your goal. Right? Right? Now, let me get back again to this question and add a few words to it. As a Christian, what is your goal in life as you live here on earth? So I added a few words. Now, just maybe after giving you my thought a while ago, maybe this time your answer would be different. And uh, I will go back to this thought later on as we progress in our uh, lesson this morning. Now, have you ever been asked this question? If you're in a boat and then you see your mother and you, you see your wife drowning, the question is, who will you save? And the boat can only carry two individuals, you and one other. Have you been asked that question? Because in my life back home, I've been asked that question so many times. And you know my answer is, or my answer was, now is my answer. I'm going to save my mother. And then someone came up to me, oh, Brother Mike, are you not going to save your wife? Oh, yeah, we get it. Because when you save your mother and not your wife, you can get another woman to marry and replace your wife, right? And you cannot get someone else to replace your mother. I was like, hello, I'm not done yet with my answer. <laughs> you know, my answer is I would go and save my mother and then go to where my wife is, jump off the boat, and help my wife get onto the boat. And then eventually saving both of them, sacrificing myself in the process. Right? You know? Well, again, so many times I've been asked that's, that question, and that's my answer is, you know? And in the process, I will be saving two souls. I know how to swim. I can swim my way back to shore, or whenever I get tired, I can float around and then swim again, right? Now, how many times we've, been see, uh, we've seen in a movie or probably in the news, in real life videos, in the news or uh, on YouTube, when a ship is about to sink, you know? And we see people shoving one another, fighting one another, you know, pulling each other and trying to get onto the ship's raft or ship small boat, right? Or we fight each other over 
the life best. Right? Of course, I cannot blame each and every one of us for doing that because that's human instinct for survival. Now, why am I saying these things? If you know that at any time your life will be taken away from you and that you will be with God, would it be wonderful to let others live? And just maybe, just maybe, they can change and turn to God and be saved just like you as well. If you know how to swim, if I know how to swim, as I said a while ago, I will, will I not sacrifice myself to save both my mother and my wife? Right? Now, can I make a suggestion? Can I make a suggestion of what will our answer be to this question? As a Christian, what is your goal in life as you live here on earth? Now, I would like to make the suggestion. Bring heaven a little closer to earth. But actually, this should be our goal while we live here on earth. When Jesus went down from heaven, he brought heaven to us. We are not by ourselves capable of going there because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3. But he was willing to sacrifice himself. Jesus was so willing to sacrifice himself for all of us so we can have a taste of heaven. And that's the reason why Jesus called us the salt of the earth, as what we have read a while ago in the scripture reading. Now, the question is, how can you bring heaven a little closer to earth? The answer is by being the salt of the earth. Our scripture reading, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how, it, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. Now here's a few trivia. Here's a few trivia about salt. Okay. Salt played a great role in man's civilization. You know, people seeing the essentiality of salt to human survival, people settled. During the old, old civilization, they settled down beside bodies of water, especially along the beach shore, where they can have access to salt. Second, a person cannot live without salt or sodium. According to Harvard Health and to some other scholarly article, human body cannot live without sodium. The third is the word salary comes from the word salt. You know, since salt was so precious during those times and sought after commodity, you know what? People were actually paid with salt mm. and not money. During the old, old civilization, salt was used for commerce. You know, the Roman soldiers were paid salt, and that's where the word salary comes from, from the Latin word salarium, where sal, in Latin, in English, that is salt, right? So this is where the common saying, being worth one's salt, came from. You know, soldiers who did a good job were worth the salt they earned. Now, we see the importance of salt. So far, my question is, as the salt of the earth, do you see your importance to this world? Are you seeing your importance to the community you belong? Are you seeing your importance to this world as God's servant? Now, why salt? Why salt? Again, salt was regarded as more, at one point in time, salt was regarded as more precious than gold. And Jesus comparing us to salt means we are much more precious 
than gold. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19, For you know that God paid a ransom and saved you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Because you and I, we are more precious than gold. Look at what Peter used. He used the word mere. It was not paid with mere gold. Mere means inadequate. Lacking in quantity or quality, very small in value. You know, that's how Peter described gold. And many today sought gold. But Peter said it's mere compared to you. Right? You are more valuable than gold. As such, you know, we don't deserve gold. We, you don't even deserve gold, as Peter put it. We deserve more than gold. We deserve, you deserve the precious blood of our master, Jesus Christ. We are precious because we are God's creation, created in his own likeness and in his own image. We are above all, his, all of his creation here on earth. Now, if that is how important we are to God, therefore we might have an important role to play as a servant of God, as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our role is to bring heaven a little closer to earth. Now, going back, as we have said, salt, number one, is salt is valuable. It played a great role in man's civilization. A person cannot live without sodium. The word salary comes from the word salt. Salt at one point considered more precious than gold. So number one is salt is valuable. When Jesus mentioned salt, it was so important during the time. When he called us the salt of the earth, at that time he mentioned this, salt was so very important. So important that it brings life to a person. Again, a person cannot live without any salt in his body. I remember back home when, uh, when we are giving canned goods, relief goods, especially the canned goods and slippers to our uh, natives, what we call the aitas. Okay. We're giving out, during that time, we're giving out canned goods. And then after a while, after they received it, then going back home, we saw them going to the lowland. Why? Because they are exchanging the canned goods for salt. They are exchanging the slippers, the sandals we gave to them for salt and a few kilo of rice. For them, salt is so much valuable. So that's how important salt is to them. Now, as a salt, you my dear brothers and sisters, are valuable to God. You have something in you that people must have in order for them to live. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. First, for the Jew first, and also for the Greeks. Now, Apostle Paul explicitly said that he is not ashamed of the gospel. Now, what does that mean? It means that he has the responsibility to bring the gospel that will give life to everyone who will accept the gospel of Christ. Paul knew in his heart that at any time God will take his life, he is ready. He is ready. But of course, he was still trying his best, his very best to serve God while he was still alive and while he was walking and roaming the earth. But as we can see, he was trying to bring heaven closer to the people through the gospel. And so like Apostle Paul, it is also our mandate to bring the gospel to the people as God commanded us to do so. 
in His great commission. Then as Jesus said, but everyone who denies me, everyone who denies me, here on earth I will deny also before my Father in heaven. Ouch. That hurts, right? That hurts. If you deny Jesus Christ here on earth, and then Jesus said, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. To deny means to refuse to confess. To deny means to refuse to confess a deliberate disregard for our public pronouncement or public announcement of the gospel of Christ or Christ himself. It is also a refusal to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. That is what is, me, what is meant by the word to deny. Now Jesus is telling us that we must bring him to this earth. Jesus said that we must bring him to your fellow individuals, to your fellow human being. And that's his mandate to all of us. And we must not deny him. Now, on the positive side of this verse, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, if we will not deny him, Jesus will give us heaven. He will not deny you before the Father in heaven. If we will profess Jesus to the people, they can have the opportunity. Let me repeat that. They can have the opportunity to have heaven while alone. Just like you. Just like all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. Whenever God calls you home, you know in your heart that you are ready. And you will have heaven. Now, let me ask you another question. And this is my favorite question. What is that, Mr. Kelman? Who wants? No, no, no. Who wants to go to heaven? Now, my second question is, come on. Who wants to go first? But, you know, kidding aside, you know deep in your heart that whenever God calls you home, you're ready. I know that, right? So why not give that opportunity that same, I would put it, same pride to the other individuals that do not have Christ so that when Christ will take them, they will be ready just like you, Brother Joe. They will be ready. That's why you are valuable just like the salt. The second one is salt gives flavor. A quote from Jay Rayner, Salt is the difference between eating in Technicolor and eating in black and white. Now, today's common use of salt is to give flavor. To give flavor. Flavor enhancer. To taste our food. Food that is bland is often considered an interesting food or a dull food, right? Now, we live in the world where everybody is in a hurry where it seems like the 24 hours a day that God had given us is always isn't enough. You know, we, we, we wake up in the morning, we eat our food, you go to work, you go back home, you eat your dinner, you go to sleep. The following day, you wake up in the morning, you take your breakfast, you go to work, you go back home, you eat your dinner, you go to sleep. The following day, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. The next day, the next day, the next day. It seems like our time is not enough. We are always in a hurry. Now, it becomes a cycle that most of people get tired and bored of it. You know, as some would put it, life has no meaning. Stereotype. That's why King Solomon was right when he said that all is vanity chasing after the wind. Then, we see injustices all around us. Those with less in life are oppressed. Now, with this going on, people lose their trust in the system. So they defy the system and make their own rules. They make their own system. It's like survival of the fittest. Now, there are those who view life as nothing but victimizing others 
because all they see around them <clears throat> is evil, right? Now, we saw how the pandemic affects most of us, especially mentally. Many have given up on life. They see life as pain, very painful. Some see life as a punishment. So they take their own life to end the pain. Now, in all of these things, they didn't see Jesus Christ. They are not seeing the beauty of living a life with Jesus Christ, with so much promises and so much color. They did not see what you and I are seeing. The question is, why is that? Why is that? Now, in a bitter world, or some would say in a tasteless world, we Christians were called by Jesus Christ to be the salt of this world, to give flavor to human lives. We are flavor enhancers. We live to help improve the quality of lives of the people. How do we do that? The Bible tells us in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. God has shown us what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In your daily lives, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, God wants these three to be the core values. We manage our lives and we treat people. You know, let us always act justly. Love mercy and forever humble with God. These three values must emanate from all of us. Inside the family, these three must be present in how we deal with the family members. Whether we be the husband, you be the wife, you be the children, these three must be present. In the community, in the neighborhood, in our neighborhood where we belong, these three must be present in how we live among them so we can live at peace with everybody. If we are working, if we are working in a secular world, whether in a private sector and most especially in the government sector, let us remember these three core values that Jesus wants us to apply. Justice, mercy, and humility. We must never deny these three things to people. We must not even condone such evil things according to Romans chapter 132. Although, although they know God's righteous decree and His judgment that those who do such things deserve death, yet they, yet they not only do them, but they even approve and tolerate others who practice them. Now, if we do all these things, people may be able to see that you are different, that you are different. They might, they might start to, you know, to put their trust back in the system and in humanity in general because they see in you that they are still genuine people, that, they are, that there are still good people living amongst them. Like you are trying to put a little taste of heaven here on earth. Now, for those friends of ours, or those in our neighborhood, for example, or those in our workplace, now, who see life as a stereotype, or see life as nothing more than pain or as a punishment just waiting for their time to die, you know, as we are the salt, as you are the salt of the earth, we must live in such a way that these people will start to compare themselves to you. Get that? They might start comparing yourselves to you and start asking questions like, why is this person full of life despite all that's happening? Why is Brother Al, or what does Brother Al have that I don't have? Why is he always smiling? Why is he always happy? Why am I not happy? What does brother Charles see in life that I don't? You see, if we live such a happy way, like what I've discussed with 
few months ago about blessedness, about being so happy in the Lord. If people would see that you are always happy, they will start comparing yourselves to them. Why is he happy? What am I missing? Right? What am I missing? James chapter 5, verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. By living a Christ-centered life, we are turning people's lives from the error of how they see life because they see life as miserable. And we are encouraging them to turn their lives to Christ. From being in error of how they see, of how they view life, now they are trying to see life with Jesus Christ because of you. Because they see in you the beauty of our King. Amen. What's that song, Sir Fay, that we used to sing? We love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We see in you what? Amen. If people will start seeing in you the beauty of our King, and we have the song, Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. If people will start seeing the beauty of Jesus in you, then, my brothers and sisters, then, probably, just maybe, they will turn the way they see life. From the error they see life, and they will look up to God and see I am happy today. Oh, yes, I'm happy today. Amen. Amen. Now, they see in your faces a reflection of a happy and a contented individual because of Jesus in your life. You know, I remember, as one said, I saw heaven smile at me. Wow. So powerful. The third is, Salt heals. The cure for anything is salt water, sweat, tears, or the sea. The truth of the matter is we are called by God to be the salt of the earth because salt heals. I remember our grandparents used to tell me um, to go to the beach and soak myself in the sea to heal my wounds faster. Now, when we have the chance, because our city is within the shorelines, it's a few minutes drive, you're now in the beach. So we used to soak ourselves in seawater. And then my, uh, my Lola or my, my grandmother would always tell us, you soak yourself in salt water so that your wound will heal faster. So. There is an interesting account in the Bible about salt. In 2 Kings chapter 2, 19-21, the people of the city said to Elijah, Look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt on it, or in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. You know, there is no doubt about the healing properties of salt. Uh, we are called by God to heal those that are hurting, to give hope to the hopeless, to be a family to those who have none, and to love the unlovable. You know, Jesus showed this to us. He walked. These very words, so that we can have an example in our lifetime. You know, he cared for the sick. He healed them. He was friends with the outcasts and sinners. He cared for the homeless. He loved the widows. Jesus became a family to those who have none. Jesus embraced the lepers when the community distanced themselves from these people. Jesus gave them hope when all they see is a pitch block of hopelessness. 
Jesus brought heaven a little closer to them and gave them a taste of heaven. Remember that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Heaven is with us. In Luke 17, 21, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. When people accepted Jesus Christ into their lives, as they live here on earth, there in them, in their heart, is the kingdom of God. As Jesus walked with them and cared for them, Jesus also showed what he represents. Jesus showed to the people what he represents. Jesus helped them restore their faith in humanity. Jesus represents this word. He restored faith in humanity. Jesus gave them hope in their hopeless state of life when people look down on them and when nobody cares. And Jesus loved them when nobody does. You know, as the salt of the earth, my dear brethren, we are to follow Jesus' example to heal the brokenness. We are to care for the orphans, as James puts it. We are told to care for the orphans and widows in their distress or afflictions. The kind of religion that God wants as true believers of Christ is we help those who cannot help themselves, the widows and the orphans. Jesus told his disciples about feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, visiting the sick, and those in prison. That Jesus said that whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25, 14. As a healing agent, you know, you need to put a dash of salt here and there, a little sprinkle of salt right here and right there. We are supposed to add zest and vigor to life as the salt of the earth. You know, visit someone in the nursing home. Look into your contact numbers. All of us have cell phones, right? How many contacts do we have in our cell phones? You drop them a note. You drop those in your contact numbers a note about God, about how God, Jesus Christ, transformed you, of what Jesus did for you. And you might be surprised, my dear brothers and sisters, you might be surprised by what your action means to that person. You know, visit a sick friend. If you have a neighbor that you know that is sick, surprise that neighbor of yours with a card or you know, pay him a visit back on their doors. We are called blessed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. We are blessed because part of being salt of the world is we are peacemakers. We heal broken relationships. Now, how can you heal a broken relationship, my dear brothers and sisters, if you yourself or if we ourselves have a broken relationship, broken relationship with God. How can you restore a broken relationship with someone if you yourselves have a broken relationship with God? If you yourself have a broken relationship with your family? If you yourself have a broken relationship with your friends? Change must start from all of us. The most powerful tool, the most powerful tool that Jesus used to heal this world that is so broken is the word love. That is the most powerful word there is. For the greatest of all is love, for God is love. Now Jesus gave us a preview of what it is in heaven, of what heaven looks like, of what is there in heaven. Because in heaven there is order, in heaven there is harmony, and most of all in heaven there is love. My dear brothers and sisters, to bring heaven a little closer to each and everyone, especially those who are, who are hurting, especially those who have no Christ in them. To love somebody when he is a nobody, to love someone when he is despised by everyone, 
and to be able to love the unlovable, that is one of the greatest things that we can do as we live here on earth. And this is the kind of salt that Jesus called us to be. Now again, if we truly believe that the kingdom of God is within us, already in our heart, would it be great to share and bring the kingdom of God to another person and be saved as well? If, however, we fail in this calling of ours by Jesus Christ to be the salt of the earth, now let me read you again our scripture reading and let me leave you with this. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Again, it is my plea to those who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in the right way according to the scripture. Peace. Please, by all means, come forward and be saved. The song of invitation is also for you as we invite you to receive Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, as we live here on earth, let us bring heaven a little closer to our fellow. Now we all stand as we sing the song of invitation to God. To God be the glory.